Hello, everybody, and welcome on this chilly spring evening to another collaboration between Norwood Community Media, Progress Norwood, Together Yes, and the Moral Memorial Library in Norwood, Massachusetts. Uh, we're very excited, particularly me, selfishly excited for tonight's program because I love getting my garden um, better up to snuff, and we got the right folks to help us out tonight. So thanks for helping us celebrate Earth Day um, in a very fun and practical way like you're going to be able to take the lessons from tonight and put them to use right away which i always love that um so tonight we are joined by one of the co-founders of blue stem natives a company that is springing up in southeast massachusetts it is actually actively springing up as we speak which we'll hear more about it is so new that it is still coming to fruition um, but I know they put a lot of hard work into it. A women-owned business in Massachusetts is a really beautiful thing. And their mission is close to my heart. And I'm sure you too. And I think we're about to get started with Kristen's program. But before Kristen starts, I'm going to turn things over to Katie. Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Neal Rizzo. I am one of the co-chairs of the green team of Progress Norwood. Um, we put together Earth Day activities each year um, around Norwood to help people get engaged in environmental activities. And again, like, like Liz said, this was a selfish, um, a selfish one for myself. This is something that is near and dear to my heart, and I'm always looking to um, make my garden and yard more um, environmentally friendly. And we found out from another Progress Norwood member about Blue Stem Natives, and she um, looked into it, and we were able to schedule them to talk to us tonight. So I'm really excited about it. Um, just a quick plug, we have another um, activity green, uh, green team initiative coming up. Um, we were supposed to do a, an Earth Day cleanup, our annual Earth Day cleanup at the um, local playgrounds and sites around town this Sunday. Unfortunately, it's supposed to be a complete washout. So we have rescheduled two of the sites, the site, um, the Oldham Elementary School and the cleanup on Upland Road have been rescheduled for this Saturday from 10 to 12. And then all of the other sites have been rescheduled for the following Sunday, May 2nd from 10 to 12. So if you would like to sign up, um, we still need volunteers, especially at the Upland Road site. We also have another site at um, Trap Hole Brook. These are a couple of sites that are right near bodies of water. We'd like to keep the trash out of the rivers as much as possible. Um, you can sign up at tinyurl.com slash Norwood Earth Day 2021, and I'll put the uh, sign up website link in the chat. So um, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm, again, I'm really excited to hear from Kristen tonight and learn about this great all women owned native nursery coming to Massachusetts. Thanks, Katie. And um, just a point of logistics for everybody joining us this evening on Zoom, please go ahead and uh, enter your questions as you think of them in the chat. We'll probably get to them at the end. Um, probably not gonna intersperse them during the program, but shout them out in the chat as you think of them. We will um, read them off at the end. So you don't need to save it to the end. Go ahead and type it in there as you think of it. All right, everybody. I think we're all ready for Kristen's talk. <clears throat> Awesome. Thank you so much. I wanted to say my uh, partners, Britt and Jasmine, are in, in, in the audience today, too. So happy to have them here. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, have you ever thought about all the crazy environmental issues going on today and just felt so overwhelmed? Um, we recycle, we compost, we switch to LEDs. It never feels like it's enough. There has to be more that we can do as individuals to make a real difference. I'm Krista Nicholson, one third of the trio of women who own Blue Stem Natives in Norwell, Mass. Our passion is educating people about the incredible ecological value of using native plants in their landscape and making native plants easier to obtain. And I'm gonna be unconventional and start off by saying that I am not an expert, even though I own a nursery. What I am is passionate and my passion drives me and my partners to help others understand just what adding native plants to your yard can do. 
not only for your health and enjoyment, but how they benefit the greater environment as well. Today, I'm gonna to go over three main actions you can take to make a big impact on the environment, on your wallet in a good way, and on your health and happiness. I'll also show how you can design a native plant garden that's going to be the envy of all your neighbors. Our three main objectives today are lose the lawn, leave the leaves, and plant natives. So not to add to the trauma, but let's revisit the big issues and see how these actions can help make a difference. We have rapidly accelerating global temperatures, annual longer lasting droughts, degradation and loss of topsoil, increased carbon emissions and air pollution from gas powered vehicles and equipment, pollution of waterways from chemical runoff, and to me, the worst is that we are currently in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. We're losing up to 150 species across the planet every day. And these issues are all huge and overwhelming on their own, but they can also directly correlate with problems that we're facing in our own small patches of land. Constant watering and upkeep of our properties cost us big in time, money, and stress. We want our spaces to be a place to relax and enjoy what we have, not to be a source of never ending chores. So how do we get there? My first suggestion is probably the most difficult. It honestly freaks most people out and your dad will think you've totally lost your mind. And that's right, it's time to lose the lawn. Stay with me here. We're going to do this together. First, some facts. Lawns cover approximately 40 million acres in the US, and that's about the size of New England. Lawns are altering our environment. They're the number one irrigated crop in our country. They're not used for food or to provide habitat of any kind, and they're expensive. In 2015, Americans spent over $29.1 billion on lawn care in one year. Lawns require toxic chemicals to maintain, posing dangers to our children, pets, wildlife, our water, and our air. Most of our turf grasses are European cold season species, so they naturally turn dormant in the summer and they green up in the cooler months. So we're constantly fighting nature at every turn, all in the name of the green lawn. Lawn care takes so much of our time. Time is just as precious a resource as water. Americans spent an estimated 1,248 days or three and a half years of their life tending their lawn. It's unrealistic to think that everyone is going to completely go lawn free. I'm not, wouldn't work for my family at all. So the next few slides show just how you can reduce your lawn without losing your mind. We want you to make your lawn reflect your lifestyle. You can completely remove your lawn if you want to, but most people need a space for recreation, for pets, and because our brains have become hardwired to accept green turf as a requirement. Think about how you use your lawn today. Do you mostly congregate to one central area and the only other action the rest sees is the weekly mowing? So keep that area that you use most often and start working from the outside in to reduce the other lawn area. Leave a space for the kids to play, the dogs to run. I think we're all looking forward to enjoying a backyard barbecue with friends and family really soon. So leave space for seating and moving around. Little volleyball action. Use strips of lawn as pathways to show intent around more natural spaces. This also helps if you live in a complex with strict planting reg regulations like an HOA. Keeping neat lines shows that your beds are intentional and you can easily take a wild area and make it a cultivated garden space. Just a quick note, in this slide, these plants aren't necessarily native shown. 
I just wanted to illustrate how you can use grass as a pathway. I love this quote, use your lawn like an area rug, not like wall-to-wall -wall property. Doug Tallamy recommends for the most impact, we should aim to reduce our lawns by half. And again, this is going to save us time, money, and protect our resources. Turf grass is pernicious stuff. So let's look at ways you can make this big idea happen. It's no small job, so do yourself and your back a favor and work in small sections. You want to reduce soil disturbance as much as possible. The more you disturb your soil, the longer it will take for your plants to establish, and you will awaken many seeds that are in the existing seed bank. Some are good, many are not good. So basically, you're creating more work for yourself down the line. Get yourself a nice sharp shovel and get to work. Cut small sections of turf, push your shovel underneath and flip that turf over, exposing the soil and burying the grass. This reduces topsoil loss. And as the grass decomposes, it will add organic matter to the soil. And if your grass is anything like mine, it's more weeds than grass. So you can cover this area with layers of plain newspaper, non-glossy cardboard, and compost in order to smother the more persistent weeds. This is a great project to do in the fall, preparing larger beds to sit over the winter and be ready to plant out in the spring. We'll talk about more of that later. We have become so accustomed to our lawns and ornamentals needing amendments that we think nothing of going to Home Depot every spring and buying a bunch of bags of soil and fertilizers. When it comes to native plants, we really have everything we need in our yards already. Some of our plants require microbes that are found in the soil in order to even germinate. And you're not gonna find those in miracle Grow. Keep as much of your soil and organic matter in your yard as possible with one exception. Clearing out a lot of invasive species often results in a lot of soil loss. You have to get all of it, every little bit. So you lose a lot of soil. And that's a whole nother presentation. So remember our goal is to mimic mother nature. She isn't buying pallets of soil for her prairies and her forest beds. This next action is for all the other lazy gardeners out there, count myself among you. So not only am I giving you permission to stop raking and bagging up all of your leaves, I'm actively encouraging you to stop. This one drives my dad nuts. Use whole leaf matter that falls from your trees as a natural mulch for your garden. You don't need to chop it up, it'll decompose just fine on its own. By doing this, you will be protecting the many overwintering butterfly and moth larvae that are cocooned in the leaf litter. Leaf litter also promotes further drought tolerance and adds nutrients to the soil as it decomposes. I was shocked to learn how many Lepidoptera, which is the scientific term for butterflies and moths, overwinter in cocoons that look exactly like leaves and sticks. The Luna moth is a gorgeous giant green moth about the size of your palm, if you've ever seen it. Uh, but in the upper left corner, you see the Luna moth cocoon just looks like a ball of leaves. Same with the giant leopard moth. If you look at it, you can't even see a cocoon there, but it's there. Many of these make cocoons while the leaves are still on the trees. So by the time the leaves fall, they're already there. So if you mow these leaves or use hurricane-like leaf blowers to push the leaves into piles, you may be preventing many organisms from completing their life cycle. My goal here is not to shame, you have to do what you have to do, but I want to gently encourage, uh, I want to encourage gentle gardening whenever possible. 
Leave leaves in garden beds where you can and gently rake the rest into a nature pile out in the back corner. Have you ever wondered why we don't see fireflies like we did as kids? I remember looking out into the backyard at dusk and seeing hundreds of blinking bug butts. Now we can see them if we go camping in the woods or we can treat our leaf litter gently. Adult fireflies lay their eggs midsummer and the larvae over winter underground in undisturbed areas. Leaf litter provides the perfect cover for these insects and more. If you can't bring yourself to leave all the leaves, at least make a pile in the corner. I bet you'd start seeing more fireflies on those warm summer nights and your kids and grandkids will thank you. Our last action is the fun one. We want you to plant natives. So why do we want you to fill your yards with native plants? Native plants are defined as those which have evolved over time through interaction with local soils, climate, fauna, and other plants without human intervention or cultivation. And in North America, these plants were present before European settlement. You can see we have quite the list here of reasons why native plants are the way to go. They are water-wise, they eliminate the need for herbicides, pesticides, and fertilization. They restore habitat for wildlife and improve genetic biodiversity, and they bring back the bugs. Quick word on the bugs, don't panic. You aren't going to be having swarms of insects. A healthy ecosystem has checks and balances. So if you encounter an issue, look to see what is lacking and creating the problem. Do you have standing water, lack of birds, lack of bats? All of these problems can be solved by planting native plants with care, using their needs to solve your problems. How many people love hummingbirds? Do you set out nectar feeders each spring? Hummingbirds only get around 10% of their calories from nectar. The rest comes from insects. A tiny hummingbird can consume anywhere from a few dozen to a few thousand bugs every day. That's a lot of bugs. And how many of you put out birdseed feeders? They're great for feeding adult birds, but baby birds don't eat seeds. They eat squishy things like caterpillars and they eat a lot of them. Adult chickadees weigh less than half an ounce, but in order to raise a nest of hatchlings, these tiny birds need to find between six and 9,000 caterpillars during the two week period they are raising their hatchlings. That's a lot of squishy things. If you haven't had the opportunity, I highly recommend reading Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home. I personally love the audiobook version. I listen to it while I'm puttering around the yard. Dr. Tallamy goes into great detail about why the bugs are such a huge part of this endeavor. The bottom line is, if you aren't seeing any bugs, you are missing a big piece of the puzzle. Okay, back to the benefits. Native plants are inherently water-wise. We are already in a statewide serious drought. This picture shows the current drought status of Massachusetts. We happen to be in that orange section, level two significant drought. It's April, that's not good. Every summer we experience water restrictions that prevent us from keeping our gardens from flourishing. Luckily, native plants often have deep root systems. They're far deeper than turf grass and most non-native ornamentals. This picture shows the difference in root systems between non-native on the left and native plants on the right. That tiny patch right in the middle there is turf grass. This is why lawns and shrubs need constant watering. So let's save the water for the veggie garden. 
Now, native plants do need regular watering when they're first planted, but once they're established, most natives can withstand drought conditions without significant dieback. Native plant gardens eliminate the need for herbicide, pesticide, and fertilizers. We've already covered the bugs, so you can stop using those dangerous chemicals on your lawn. Don't be fooled by companies that swear their products don't harm pollinators. It may not be direct, but they will take a hit. Remember the hummingbirds. If you spray for mosquitoes and midges, you are removing a huge food source for them. If mosquitoes are a problem, find and remove standing water on your property and install patio fans. The gentle breeze will keep flying insects away. When planted in their proper locations, native plants can help keep non-native weeds at bay with some brutal exceptions. Japanese knotweed, I'm looking at you. Well-planned native gardens will greatly reduce or eliminate the need for herbicides. You'll never have to buy another bag of weed and feed again. And native plants have evolved in our lovely New England soil all that sand, rocks, and nutrient-poor topsoil. Most ornamentals would wilt faster than Scarlet O'Hara. In fact, many of our natives require these conditions to thrive. Many plants work to improve the soil, fixing nitrogen and adding organic matter to regenerate the space they inhabit. At most, and rarely, you may need to add a little bit of compost but it should be done sparingly. Native plants provide diverse habitats for a wide variety of wildlife, including native birds, butterflies, bees, and other organisms. Many of which are specialists, only able to feed on a single species of plant. The monarch butterfly is one of the most well-known specialists. When an insect is a specialist, it means it has evolved and developed alongside one specific species of plant in an area, only able to gain vital nutrition from that one plant. The monarch butterfly is a specialist for the sleepiest species, commonly known as the milkweeds. The adult monarch will only lay its eggs on milkweed. And when the larvae hatch, they're only able to feed on the milkweed leaves. While the white sap of the milkweed is toxic, monarch caterpillars have developed a protection against it over thousands of generations. Milkweed used to be found in great swaths all over the country, but once it was deemed a weed, it was mowed into oblivion. As a result, the monarch population is down to around 10% and it will very likely face extinction in the coming years. If you're interested in learning some more, our friend Katie Banks Home is a wealth of knowledge about monarchs. You can find her at themonarchgardener.com. Quick side note, the type of milkweed you plant matters. You wanna plant according to your local ecotype. Tropical milkweed belongs in tropical locations. Planting it in the Northeast disrupts monarch migration. While we're on the topic of choosing one type of plant over another, let's touch on the sticky subject of cultivars. And I'll try not to get too preachy. A cultivar is, simply put, a cultivated variety. At some point, a human saw a pretty plant and cultivated that plant over and over until they obtained the characteristics they were looking for, like an unusual flower color, variegated leaves, or double blossoms. In order to keep that characteristic, they have to propagate the plant through asexual means, or clonal propagation, which is either divisions, cuttings, or tissue cultures. So most cultures, cultivars are sterile for that reason. If you were to save seed from a gorgeous sunset echinacea, made that one up, to grow next year, 
you'll instead end up with a flower that resembles the parent plant many generations ago. Cultivar cultivars are often also trademarked, making it illegal to take cuttings or divide the plant and sell or even gift to others. So how do you know you have a cultivar? You wanna look at the plant tag. If you see a descriptive name in quotes, you have a cultivar. When you see those quotes, you know that this plant is an exact copy of the original plant. So what difference does this make? It actually quite a big one, ecologically speaking. Genetic diversity is a very good thing in all aspects of life. In this case, genetic diversity comes from the sexual reproduction of plants, that is to say grown from seed, the way it is in nature. Cultivars reduce genetic diversity, essentially the opposite of all our goals here. What we are ideally looking for are seed grown straight species, which means no hybrids or cultivars and sourced as close to our eco region as possible. So as not to come off as a purist, I'll stress that it's important to find a balance. If you have a few must have cultivars, go ahead and plant them. Balance the scales with more straight species natives nearby. So if you must have a butterfly bush, you don't really, but plant a nice plot of butterfly weed close by. There is emerging evidence that most cultivars do not support wildlife as well as straight species natives. Studies have shown that depending on the characteristic manipulated, cultivars hold little to no value for pollinators. Some characteristics don't appear to hurt, like cultivating for height or for pest resistance. But once you start messing with the flowers and the leaves, you degrade the value for our native pollinators and birds. I recently wrote a blog post detailing this very subject on our website, if you'd like to learn more. So let's get to planting, shall we? Remember earlier I mentioned that the fall was a good time to prepare beds? Well, that's true, but you can also get started right now. Using that same method of flipping the turf and either planting into it or covering it with layers of plain newspaper and uh, non-glossy cardboard and compost, you can start planning out your spaces in a way that best suits your time and budget. If you have enough of both to manage a section in your front yard, great. Prepare your bed and get enough plants to place throughout, taking into consideration space for maturity and spread. Fill in the bare spots with leaf litter. The leaves will allow seeds to fall down into the soil and protect them from birds. The seeds will naturally stratify over the winter and will germinate on their own in the following spring. Plant kits are the perfect choice for this kind of method. When it comes to garden design, there's a saying in the native plant world, right plant, right place. You can want to put that great blue lobelia in your super sunny front yard all you want, but it won't grow as well as it would in a shadier spot. Be thoughtful when it comes to selecting plants. Look at each bed with the following checklist in mind. What are the soil conditions? Is it sandy, loamy, clay? How about sun or shade? And how much water does this area receive? Is it often dry or do puddles form? Once you have these important facts down, you can move on to designing the beds. Pop online and look for garden designs that catch your eye. The plants don't have to be native. You're looking for color, height, spacing. This is one of the examples I'm basing my design off of in my backyard. In the place of that tall orange and pink in the back there, I'm gonna plant sweet Joe pie weed and big leaved asters. 
Hobble bush viburnum will fit in the place of the hydrangea with some pruning. Golden alexanders will fill in the middle layer. And I'll use a creeping ground cover like wild strawberry to fill in the bottom layer and provide a living mulch. This doesn't have to be complicated. If you're going to the garden center, you would be looking at the plant height, the color, the sun and soil, same thing. Now I'm gonna throw one curve ball here. In order to have a truly environmentally thoughtful garden, it is super important to pay attention to bloom times. You want something delicious blooming in your garden throughout the spring, summer, and fall in order to support our native pollinators. If everything blooms at once, it's gonna look spectacular, but in a few short weeks, everything will revert back to green and our bees and butterflies will be out of luck. We're all familiar with the naturalized meadow look that people think of when they hear native plant garden. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's the look you want but many people want more structure in their yards. So make your native plant beds look more intentional with a few easy steps. Keep your edges sharp and defined. Use lawn or low growing natives as a manicured path throughout the different areas of your yard. And plant in groupings. Don't just go and buy one of each plant, buy nine of each three groups of three. You can keep the cost down by buying smaller plants, which are easier to establish as a side benefit. You wanna figure out a design and then repeat that design throughout the yard. This will make the plants form a cohesive look. And no matter the weed moniker, each plant will work with others and look like it was meant to be there, which of course it was. So you've been very patiently waiting for this last bit, what to plant in your wood. I have a few suggestions for native plants that will work well here as well as surrounding towns. And all of the plants I recommend here are straight species. Remember, we're avoiding cultivars as much as possible. If you're looking for plants that have the greatest impact, check out the Native Plant Finder at nwf.org. So we're lucky to have a lot of trees in Norwood, but if you're looking to plant one or three, try to choose according to the most ecologically valuable. Top of that list by far are oaks. They're followed by cherries, willows, and birch. If you're looking for shrubs to replace invasives like Rose of Sharon and Burning Bush, Yes, they are both invasive. We love New Jersey tea, Ceanothus americanus, viburnum, which is the American cranberry bush, viburnum trilobum, the high bush blueberry, vaccinium cornbussum. We love service berry, one of our favorites, Amelanchier canadensis. And also there's the witch hazel, Hemimalis virginiana. Cool party trick if you can just roll scientific names off your tongue like that. People will think you're a genius. It just takes a little practice. Uh, rhododendron and azaleas are native here too. Remember, no cultivars. Pollinator powerhouse plants. These plants were specifically chosen to support our at-risk bumblebees, as well as other pollinators. Top of the list for us is the purple, the giant purple hyssop, Agastache scrofulariae folia. We love showy goldenrod, Solidago speciosa. And my personal favorite is the bee balm, Monarda fistulosa. Uh, we have foxglove beard tongue, penstemon digitalis, and of course, the milkweeds, the Asclepius family. We have quite a few that are native in this area. 
For ground cover or lawn replacement, this is just a few that we recommend. Top of our list is the Pennsylvania Sedge. We love this, Carex Pennsylvanica. This is a tall, you know, moderately tall growing. It looks just like grass, it's a sedge. You can let it grow. It'll flop over a nice, pretty little swaths all through your yawn. You can mow it if you really want to. You don't have to. And you'd only need to mow it once, maybe twice a year. Wild strawberry is another favorite of ours. Fragara virginiana. Plantain pussy toes. These are adorable. Antonaria plantinogenifolia. And one of our many native violets, bird's foot violet, Viola pedata. So a quick word on kits. We've made native gard gardens easy, putting together kits of 18 plants designed to work together. We have a variety of kits for different needs, including sun or shade gardens, hell strips, hummingbird gardens, monarch and at-risk pollinator gardens and others. So a question we get often is where can we buy native plants? Obviously, Blue Stem Natives. There are other places, of course, too. Uh, Garden in the Woods in Framingham is an excellent place. And our friend, the Monarch Gardener up in Ipswich also sells straight species natives. So we are so lucky to have some of the best resources on native plants locally, along with bluestemnatives.com. We have the Native Plant Trust in Framingham, the Monarch Gardener in Ipswich. GoBotany.org is an excellent website for determining if a native plant, if, if a plant is native in this area. And the CaterpillarLab.org, which is a phenomenal site filled with all kinds of caterpillars, I guarantee your kids will go crazy over it. We also have national informational sites like nwf.org for that native plant finder and Doug Tallamy's homegrown nationalpark.org. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you learned something new and I'm happy to take any questions and answer when I can. All right, this was wonderful. I have the chat set so that not everybody can see it and I can tell you it is lighting up with questions. So that's very exciting. Oh boy. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was great. I, I am, I'm sure among good company here that I, my brain is spinning in a million directions for things I wanna do first. Um, so questions from folks range from general to specific. Um, one kind of more general question is, we saw a ton of lists in your presentation here. Um, good steps to follow, good lists for resources. Is there a way for us to access some of these lists and topics and so forth on your website? Absolutely. Britt is a website guru and she has arranged our website to have all of these. I, I got all of our information from there. We have um, lists even more extensive than what I went over um, for all kinds of different areas. You can look and see what we carry. We also have links for outside of our website for other places that carry those plants. We have the plant kits as well. Um, so all of that and some of the blog posts too that I mentioned, um, all that information is available on our website. Wonderful. Um so I have a couple of general, let's start back at the beginning, a couple of lawn specific questions. Ooh, so yeah. if somebody has a more wild yard, are there ways that you know of to minimize ticks? Because we know that those are oh. an increasing problem in Massachusetts. That is the question, like it's being asked at every single webinar right now. Um, so basically you really can't minimize the ticks if they're just, they're just a kind of a fact of life around here. What is important is you want to build habitat and encourage wildlife that will get rid of the ticks for you or the cause of ticks for you. Um, so you want to encourage foxes 
in your neighborhoods. You want to encourage um, one of those other little guys that everybody hates. My mind is blank. I can't think of it. <laughs> um, opossums. The opossums, thank you so much. You want to encourage the opossums because they eat a ton of ticks. Um, ornamental plants, invasive plants like the Japanese barberry are well known for harboring ticks uh, like crazy. I pulled one out of my own yard and you could see them running from the plant. It was disgusting. So basically prevention is kind of the key and just kind of paying attention to, you know, if you are going walking through uh, long grasses, make sure you're using proper bug protection, make sure you check yourself after you go through them. But aside from that, we just kind of have to, sorry, <laughs> it's not probably not the answer that you're looking for. All right. I have a couple of mulch related questions. Um, okay. So you mentioned the waste piles, the natural waste piles of leaves that can accumulate in the back corner of people's yards. Um, is that a good place to go looking for creating your own natural mulch? Or do you have other ideas for what can be done with those natural leaf piles? Well, I mean, ideally you just wanna let them sit. You don't want to agitate them very much. Uh, but yeah, leaf compost is amazing. So if you want to use that and make the compost, you can split it up. You don't have to put all of it in those natural piles. Um, you could get some garden wire fencing and make like a little round section and kind of let it compost down. And every so often pick that wire section up and move it to another spot. And then you have this leaf mold it's called, and it's just the most phenomenal compost that you can really get. And it's all natural from your own yard. So you know that no chemicals are in there. You know what, what it's made of, basically. You don't get that from any store. Um, but you really want to try to leave at least a, um, an amount, a decent amount. Just leave it be. Let it do its thing. Mm -hmm. And actually, you just mentioned compost. Earlier in the talk, you mentioned composting sparingly. Is it possible to over compost? With native plants, it, it is a bit, yeah. Um, especially if you're using really rich compost like manure, uh, native plants really don't love it. <laughs> so um, your best compost would be the leaf mold compost. Just because again, with, if it falls there, it's meant to be there. Um, if you're using a manure, it really has to be well aged and again, sparingly. Um, when we did our plant sale for wild ones last spring, we used compost and we used um, some biochar and things. And it turned out that really it was too rich of an environment for a lot of our natives and they didn't do so hot. So keep it simple. Another lawn question. If we are going to maintain some areas of lawn, you know, for kids and dogs to run around in and because we're used to that green space, what do you think of um, clover as a grass replacement in that case? I mean, clover's great. If you're going to have something, it's not native. Um, just like the turf grasses are not native. Um, but they do, you know, the pollinators are in there too. So clover to me is maybe a little bit a step ahead on top of uh, the, the turf grasses. <laughs> so if you want to add some clover, sure. And speaking of grasses, and I know the answer to this one because I was poking around on your website looking for it. Are there ornamental grasses that are native that you would suggest? As a matter of fact, there are. Um, little blue stem would be the best one that we love. We love little blue stem. There's also purple love grass, which is adorable. So cute. It has a really cute little purple color at the bottom. And um, there's big blue stem, of course. 
So all of them have different situations where they're better for. They would all have really deep root systems. So amazing for uh, soil erosion problems. And um, yeah, you can use them just like you would any of the ornamental grasses that you'd get at the garden center. Awesome. Um, and for those of us who haven't ditched our yards just yet, um, there is a kind of a, a, a trend, I suppose, called no mow May. So basically postponing that first mow. What are your thoughts on that? I think anything you do to support the native pollinators in the area is a good thing. Um, I'm not a purist about anything. So I think even little steps, if that's what it takes to make you feel, you know, and you're helping, you are helping pollinators, then that's great. Um, I would say also add to that, don't spray chemicals. That's a really big one. If you can do those two things, you're doing pretty decent steps forward. Um, a little note, dandelions are not native plants. Uh, a lot of people think they are, they're not but they're okay. They're like a non-noxious, non-native plant. <laughs> so we don't mind them so much, but they're not native. Now, uh, speaking of, of May in this time of year, we're all kind of loving the forsythia we're seeing all over the place. Um, <laughs> but is that actually native? Um, and so what are your thoughts on forsythia? And also something that I'm not familiar with called the pawpaw tree. Oh, okay. I like these questions. Uh, I'm sorry, Forsythia are not native and they're actually pretty damaging to our environment. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I know. We're so used to seeing just brown everywhere that the, that burst of yellow is phenomenal, but I'm sorry, it's not native. Um, and honestly, it breaks my mother's heart. She loves her forsythia and I had to tell her. <laughs> um, the problem with forsythia is it, it spreads like crazy. The reason why you see yellow everywhere is because it's spreading everywhere. Um, and you can try and hack out a forsythia bush in your yard and it will come back and it'll come back and it'll come back. So that's kind of the very definition of invasive. Um, and it's the real problem with it is our native woodland species of plants are the first ones to bloom. And they bloom because um, the sunlight is still getting through the trees. The trees haven't leafed out yet. And those native woodland species are so important for our at-risk bumblebees and other pollinators but forsythia bloom really early too. And they shade out all of the native woodland plants. So that's really what the problem is. It may not be a problem in your little yard, but it's a problem out there. And that's, that's the real issue. Um, spice bush is a really great replacement for the forsythia. We like the colors of that. Uh, witch hazel is another one with that yellow Blooms at a little bit of different time, doesn't quite match up, but it helps. So yeah, sorry, for Cynthia is not, not native. <laughs> well, related to that, do you have recommendations for natural privacy, such as trees and shrubs? Because that is one thing for Cynthia does, is it, you know, it kind of marks mm -hmm. the edge of people's yards and provides a little privacy. So besides um, spice bush, what else? Absolutely. Um, in one of my lists, I said serviceberry right now. It's starting to bloom right now. So serviceberry would be an excellent option. It does spread out a little bit. So you can, uh, if you like that, you can just, you know, let it go or you can prune it down a little bit, keep it in shape. Um, it has beautiful white blossoms and it does have that kind of thicket mentality that forsythia does too. So do the same thing and it supports um, pollinators and insects and it's giving our native bumblebees uh, a quick hit. We're nice and early. 
Sorry, I'm freezing down here. <laughs> so I'm like shivering. Oh, I hope you can take a few more questions because they keep coming in Absolutely. as we talk. Like they're <laughs> flowing in here. Um, I'm going to skip a few of this really specific questions um, and talk about a few more native things. Um, oh, oh, this is a very local question. Okay. Black swallow wart. It Oof. imitates milkweed and kills monarchs. And in Norwood, it is a constant problem in the community garden. Is it native? Uh, I don't believe so. I don't believe it's native because it, it really the definition of invasive is non-native. Um, black swallow wart is, is a horrible plant. I have it in my yard as well. You want to get it early, as early in the year as you can. And it is, I always say this word wrong, it's allelopathic. So it is, the roots are really changing the composition of the soil and preventing other plants from growing in that area too. So that's really what um, a big part of that problem is. But yeah, it is one, it is part of the milkweed family, not native to this area and um, not in a good way either. So the monarchs do somehow um, recognize it as a milkweed, but their defenses against it have not developed. So it like the larvae hatch um, and they can't eat the black swallow wart leaves. They just die. There's no coming back from it. So it's nasty stuff, I'm sorry. And speaking of a community garden, can you recommend some native edible plants? <laughs> So we do have some um, edible lists on our website as well. And I highly recommend you go through there. Um, depending on space, um, elderberry is a very well-known edible uh, plant. Um, we have the, um, the ostrich fern has those edible fiddleheads. So edible only in a very short time frame in the spring. Um, we have the wild strawberry, which is an ed edible fruits. However, you will really have to be quick to snag those because <laughs> the wildlife will probably get them um, sooner. But I do recommend checking out our website for that list because uh, we have a whole list of all kinds of things with links going out to recipes and more information. And I will say, always be extremely careful. Don't be going out into the woods and saying, oh, that looks like wild ginger. Um, make sure you know exactly what it is that you're, you're ingesting. That's a marvelous segue, Kristen, into the next question. Um, <laughs> multiple people wanna hear more about your website. Um, they wanna know where they might be able to pick things up if they should purchase something. And also a number of things say coming soon. Can you tell us more about it? Yes, so we say coming soon because we are growing all our plants ourselves and a lot of them are still kind of this big. So we will be putting our plants um, when we feel comfortable that they will survive well and do well in your garden. And we will be adding um, our plants with sizes and prices fairly soon. Um, we're looking for the middle of May for opening, I think, Britt and Jasmine. <laughs> um, you can order online. We're gonna have online pickups for, uh, online ordering and pickups for the first month that we open. Um, this whole time of COVID is, it's just kind of brutal, uh, especially for a small business that's trying to open up. So we're going to do online ordering, which I know is kind of weird for plants, but we'll be okay. And then you can pick them up at our nursery in Norwell, Mass. And our um, address will be posted on our website when we get everything finished and buttoned up. Okay, so you mentioned things going into people's yards. What about those of us who have patios to work with as our garden space? Do you have recommendations for plants that thrive pots? Um, there's a specific question about bee balm, for instance. <laughs> Love it, it's so good. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, native plants can 
do well in containers. You it really will depend more, less on the, the plant in the container and more on your attention to the plant. So everybody knows that containers uh, dry out a lot faster. Um, but again, our native plants don't always like too much water too. So you kind of have to find a little bit of a balance there. Um, really, you kind of just want to let them, you know, water them well, let them dry, almost dry, and then water them again. They're not the type of thing where you're going to water them every single day. Um, bee balm is a great plant. Um, most plants in, in the containers are going to stay a little bit smaller, but you might find that you do need larger or taller plants um, because a lot of our native plants have quite a bit of height to them. Um, so you, you can try pruning things down, making them a little bushier, um, but you might find a lot of them do get a decent amount of height. Mm -hmm. And speaking of water, and this is, you know, really specific to Norwood at the moment because of a recent um, uh, push for rain barrels being made av available mm -hmm. to people in the community. Uh, where and how would you recommend using rain barrel water? If you have plants that do better in, um, or like, like wet feet, um, and they do better in more moist conditions, you would be better off using your rain barrel water on those plants, especially if the soil isn't ideal for them on a regular basis. So I would always err to the side of um, keeping your moist soil loving plants happy. Um, really, and it's very important when you first establish your garden, uh, when you're first planting things out, they need regular watering, just like any other plant would. Um, we're always saying, oh, native plants don't need a lot of attention or water. They do when they're babies, they totally do. Um, so I would make sure that you're getting those plants that like their feet wet, keep them happy, and then go to the other plants that could use a little drink. If you have time for just a couple more questions, we have a couple specific sure. species questions. Thank you very much for all your time this evening, but we're getting, all, we're getting, you know, our time's worth here. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> oh, and somebody did find black swallowwort is originally from Europe. So there you maybe. go. Yeah. All right. Uh, you mentioned service berries a number of times. I used to be very familiar with a very big service berry. So I, it's one thing I've thought about planting here in my own yard. Um, do you know off the top of your head about how big a service berry will get? Somebody recently came into uh, acquiring one and they, they're curious. <laughs> You're testing me. <laughs> um, I'm going to say off the top of my head and Britt or Jasmine could throw it in the chat for you too. I want to say it's around eight to 10 feet maybe. And it has a fairly wide um, shape to it too. So you want to make sure you're planting with the mature size in mind. Um, I'm pretty sure it's around the eight to 10 feet, but it can be pruned too. So you can, if you wanna put the work in, you can prune them down and keep them, you know, a little bit more compact. So like seven and a half feet. <laughs> the birds love them in the fall. It's really cool to watch when the berries are out. Mm -hmm. um, so oh. good. And it smells so good. another specific species question. Um, mountain laurel shrub, is that one native? It is. Oh, no. It is, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is It is native, uh, but it really doesn't do well here. So it's native to, this is kind of where it gets a little dicey. It's native to Massachusetts, but um, more in like higher elevations. Um, I mean, listen to the name, it's mountain. So like higher, cooler elevations, it's gonna, you're gonna fight it. If you're gonna try and plant it here, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna fight you <laughs> every step of the way. Um, I don't think we're even carrying it because it just, it just doesn't do well around here. Um, 
But if you want to give it a go, sure. Oh, and Jasmine did chime in in the chat. The service berry can grow up to 20 feet at mature. Oh, no. <laughs> That's going to be a legacy tree. <laughs> I don't be in sick. So you could prune it. Just prune it. You'll be fine. Just prune it. <laughs> oh, actually, a couple people want to get a little clarification on cultivars. Mm -hmm. So can you remind us again, when we're looking at the plant tag, how do we know it's a cultivar? Oh, sorry, cultivar. And um, so we kind of just want to avoid anything with that italic in quotes sort of presentation. So, yes. Um, so you will see here, let me see if I can, I don't know if I can zip back real here. Um, oh, there it goes. Okay. So if you, can you see my little pointer here? Yeah. This top line is the scientific name. Uh, that I think that's Pieris Japonica. Um, side note, if you see something that says Japonica, it's not native. Um, and so that's the scientific name. You're going to see that on just about any plant tag that you buy. If you don't see a scientific name, you're probably not buying from someone who knows what they're doing. So just saying, um, and you would see if it is a cultivar, there are laws requiring the gardener to make sure they disclose that. So this right here, that middle line um, with the single quotation is the cultivar name. And they often have um, really fanciful names like named after the gardener's daughter or, um, you know, purple, yellow, I don't, I don't even know. I can't even make them up there. Some of them are really crazy. Um, but if you see, it's really that single quotation and it will tell you that that's a cultivar. And the common name would be underneath that. Um, we try really hard to encourage people to use scientific names whenever you can. Don't be intimidated by it. I know, I know it's hard. <laughs> but the problem with using common names all the time is what you call Lily of the Valley I might call Solomon Seal and they look kind of the same, you know, like there's, there's different things. They, so we might be talking about two different plants, but um, we have different names or we might have, um, we might be talking about the same plant and we have different names, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Um, so we really recommend that you try to use the scientific names as much as possible um, and not the common names. And the cultivar is, it, it should be disclosed on any plant tag that you get. Do you know if there are any cultivars in this area that are more problematic than others? Um, so specifically, no. Really the, the problem comes when you have, when you're messing with the blooms. Um, and the leaf colors. That's really where you are causing um, the issue. Uh, double blossoms are pretty detrimental. Um, and it stinks because we all love them. They're gorgeous. But they, aside from being probably sterile and not having any nectar or anything, um, bees and, and birds and bumblebees and all of them, they can't get into those blooms. They're not meant to like go swimming in the, in the flower blossoms. Um, they just want to get in and out, get their pollen and move on. Um, so they can't access any of it. So those are strictly for human enjoyment only. Um, they do absolutely nothing for pollinators. Um, as far as leaf color, um, there was some, and it, there's, there's still a lot of um, explora exploration of this that needs to be done, but when you change the color of leaves, um, pollinators can only see certain colors. So if you're changing a plant leaves from say green to purple, which happens quite often because people love those different colors, uh, the bees can no longer recognize that plant. Um, so now they've essentially gone blind to it. They can't see it. 
so they they miss it. And since you have this slide on the screen, somebody's wondering if there is a a, a variation of Pieris japonica, something similar that is native to our area. Oh, for sure. lily of the valley. I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> That was a tricky I don't one. know. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. That would definitely be a, a question for Jasmine, I think. Jasmine would probably. <laughs> well, while Jasmine's thinking about it, somebody has a question Jasmine. about winter moths, which mm -hmm. um, we all know <laughs> if we walk outside in the fall, they will just swarm us. Um, mm -hmm. And in the springtime, the worms, you know, they kind of make a mess of their own. And if it rains, it gets slippery. And is there mm -hmm. any, you have any suggestions for how to handle winter moths that don't involve pesticides and spraying? Yes, don't spray. Um, so this is kind of, I, I almost would refer you to look into Doug Tallamy's work. Um, I'm kind of a fangirl in case you haven't noticed. Um, he actually, talks about this in a lot of his um, talks. You can find them all over the place, webinars. He does them prolifically. Um, and he recently brought up the issue of winter moths. And they don't seem to think, they, scientists, don't seem to think that winter moths are gonna be a huge problem going forward because of the biocontrols that they've been instituting. And um, I mean, you can do things like change out your external home lights to a, um, a yellow or better, a red bulb. Uh, that will prevent the moths from being attracted to them so they don't swarm you as you come out the door. Um, so things like that. But really, I feel like I'm gonna make enemies, but um, you just kind of wanna leave them be. So even though they're annoying to us, they're also a food source to the birds um, and, and they do eat them. Um, recently, Doug Palmy said that even though we're concerned about um, the winter moths um, stripping trees, that's part of their, the tree's um, life cycle, like basically. <laughs> um, so if you're doing the work to building up a, a healthy ecosystem in your yard. You're inviting all those birds and, and um, other organisms to your yard. They're gonna take care of the problem for you. Very cool. And we do have an answer from Jasmine, by the way. Um, <laughs> she said cannot that. promise that I have the best pronunciation on this, but here we go. Um, Pyrus floribunda, also yeah. known as mountain fetterbush, is native to the southern U.S., but we don't mm -hmm. have anything quite like it that's native to New England. Yeah, I think probably if, it depends on what you're looking for if you want lily of the valley. Do you want a, a spreading ground cover for that shady woodland edge? Um, because we have things that, I mean, um, Tiarella cordifolia, uh, which is foam flower, that's one of my favorite um, plants to put in a in a that kind of condition. Um, so kind of the same look. It has the wider green leaves, and then it has the pretty white flowers that pop up. So really, if you're if you have your heart set on um, like a lily of the valley or or a plant, you can look for those characteristics and kind of find things to mimic them pretty easily too. Actually, Britt is coming to the rescue here with multiple suggestions. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. um, Japanese Andromeda replacements include, again, my pronunciation, you know, um, Clethra, with the starts with a C. Clethra. Clethra. Mm -hmm. Button Bush, New yeah. Jersey Tea, yeah. and another replacement for getting that evergreen sort of a look would be Inkberry. One all oh, word Inkberry. Love it. Inkberry, yep. This is great. Absolutely. So much. See, they're great. Aren't they awesome? <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask just the 
only question I haven't gotten to yet, and it's kind of a biggie, and I'm not really sure. Um, I don't really have the answer to it. So the gardening industry, you know, lawn care management companies all remove a lot of native plants like goldenrod and milkweed and so on and replace it with non-native grasses. Is there anything that we can do to educate an industry? Ooh, mm. I think, I'm gonna organize my thoughts on this one. Sure. So there's a reason why the three of us decided to start a plant nursery in the middle of a pandemic um, when we couldn't even meet together. We've been building our business on Zoom um, for probably, I think the last, what, six or eight months now. Um, so there's a reason why we chose now to do this. And we've noticed um, a wave that people, and maybe we can thank the pandemic for this. People were stuck at home and they started to pay attention. They started to look in their yards and go, huh, no butterflies. Or like, where are all the birds? Um, I don't remember this. It's not like it was when I was younger. Um, and they started watching all the bazillion webinars that people had and they started paying attention. And when they started paying attention, they realized they can't get these flowers and these plants very easily because they've never been in demand before. So I guess, I think we'll start seeing a real shift coming. Um, we've already seen it. And so we decided to hop on board and try and ride that. Um, but I think you're gonna start seeing a real shift in the way people are doing things. The way to push that shift is to require it. So if you have landscapers, tell them, do not use um, leaf blowers in my yard. Do not remove any, you know, mark off areas. If you have a native plant garden, mark it off. Don't touch it, don't mow it, don't clip it, don't do anything and tell them why. Tell them, you know, you can give them uh, links and, and tell them why it's important to you and why you don't want them using it. As far as other garden centers, they're gonna grow what you want. So if you want straight species, non-cultivars, tell them. Um, lots of garden centers do grow what's called native ours. And that's, uh, I feel like that would go <laughs> into a whole nother presentation, but those are essentially cultivars of native plants. And I, in the hierarchy, I would say native plants, straight, straight, straight species, native ours, cultivars. Um, they might be like a tiny bit better than a cultivar, but really, meh. <laughs> if you can choose, a straight species plant, you wanna do that. Um, a lot of the bigger nurseries, I mean, I hate to say it, but the money is in the cultivars. It's when they are able to propagate a plant and trademark it, they're the only ones that can grow that plant. And if uh, other nurseries wanna sell it, they have to purchase the rights from that nursery. So there's a lot of money involved in it. But if enough people get together and say, this is what we want, and we want you to provide it for us, then um, they're going to follow the money and they're going to provide it. But Blue Stem Natives is already providing it. There we go. <laughs> Yay. All right, folks, I think we ran a little bit over what we expected, but I think we all enjoyed it. Oh, oh, hang on. Here's a there's off, more. Of, off of the last thing you said there, um, for the town of Norwood, do you have any tools in your toolbox for how we might convince um, the people in, in capital T town to use native plantings? Well, I mean, it, it goes back to the 
strength in numbers. Um, I would, there are lots of tools out there and there are lots of groups that have been um, making a lot of headway. Um, Jasmine and Britt chime in. There's a town, I know Bridgewater very recently became, how did they pronounce it? They said it like, it was like a, essentially they, they wanted to make it like a pollinator friendly um, town. So they are committed to only planting Norwoods in, I mean, Norwoods, <laughs> only planting natives in public spaces. So it's basically if a group of people get together, go to the, um, the town management and explain to them why these things are important, um, use the time and the money side of things. Like once these things are planted, you're not going to have to be mowing constantly. You're not going to have to be watering and weeding and doing all these things. Set aside a spot. I mean, how big is Father Max? Like that whole section, you could plant pollinator gardens everywhere over there and it would be amazing. Um, so all of those things would definitely help. If you can especially state how it saves the town money, Mm -hmm. It's always a win. And uh, Britt does have the answer. Native Plant yes, Gardeners is the group. Native Plant Gardeners yeah. of Southboro. There it is. <laughs> I knew she would. <laughs> yeah, they just recently, it was a big thing. Like they went to all the town meetings. They basically made giant pests of themselves. And uh, um, it worked. It worked. <laughs> Um, and uh, Jasmine also shared a link about Bridgewater because so this is really great. I live next door to Bridgewater, so I'm a little bit proud right here. She shared a link um, about the, the pollinator friendly community, and I will send that out to uh, to everybody who signed up tonight when I send out the recording later on. OK, yeah, strength in numbers works every time. Wonderful. All right. So um, thanks to Britt and Jasmine for chiming in and, and joining us. and. Thank you, Kristen, for being the front person to take us on this journey of native planting. Um, if we were in, pub, in person, we would all um, go in a round of applause right now, but as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Right.